live. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, of which there are a few classes today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited today because we are joined right now by six classes from across North America. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Miss Robinson's grade nines in Toronto, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, that's you. Yes. Or Thornhill, either one. It's all around the same place. It's great. <laughs> we've got Miss Winning's grade five sixes in Barrie, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey, welcome back. We've got Miss Jacobs grade five sixes in Mississauga, Ontario. Hey! <laughs> yes, crowd around the camera. Stay right there. That's the best. Uh, we've got Miss Rivas five sixes in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hello. Let's unmute you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Welcome in, guys. All right. Uh, we've got Miss Demille's grade sixes in Cordes in Ontario. Hi, everybody. Hey. hey. By the way, what is with all these five, six splits classes? It's very exciting today. And then Miss Lodes is grade fives in Ch St. Charles, Missouri, our only U.S. classroom today. So welcome in, guys. How you doing? Let's see if we got their mic working. We don't have their mic working, but we'll pin the video on them so we can see how excited they are. Awesome. All right. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, by Nathalie Ouellet, and she is the Canadian Outreach Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, one of the coolest pieces of hardware ever going to go to space in the history of mankind coming soon. So she's going to explain a little bit about that. She's also an avid outreach scientist and science communicator. She is the coordinator for the Institute for Research of Exoplanets at the University of Montreal. She studies formations of galaxies. She studies planets that are far off in other solar systems. She has the coolest job in the world. Without further ado, yep, picture hair, Natalie. That's the best part. Uh, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. And hi, everyone from all over North America. Um, I'm so glad to be here. This is my second time doing Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Um, you can see me in my office right now, the University of Montreal. I am surrounded by boxes because we are currently uh, packing up all our things and we're moving to a new campus early next semester. So that's very exciting. There's a brand new campus, all glass walls. It looks like it's from the future and everything. So I'm really excited to move there um, very soon. So as Jesse mentioned, my name is Natalie Willett. I am an astronomer or astrophysicist at the University of Montreal. I, I wear lots of different hats. Uh, I have lots of different roles here, but mostly I'll be speaking to you today as the outreach scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. So I've prepared some, um, a presentation for you very quickly uh, because astronomy is a very visual science and we have lots of interesting things to show you. So I'll talk to you a little bit about my job and a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope mission. So I have known that I wanted to be an astronomer for a very, very long time. Uh, I always have been very curious about how nature works. And I knew that if I wasn't gonna be an astronomer, I would be like an atmospheric scientist. I love tornadoes and clouds and the weather and animals. So I love figuring out how nature works and I like to observe a lot. And not all astronomers are observers, but I really like to do the part where you go to a telescope and you get to observe the universe. So I really like that. And I have the chance to do that every once in a while, which is not always a given nowadays because a lot of telescopes are automatic. They're, they're robotic now. And so you can control them for very far away. But sometimes you get to still go to the telescopes. So here you have two telescopes that are used by Canadians in Hawaii on the top of a mountain called Mauna Kea. It's one of the tallest mountains in the world. Um, and usually when you think of Hawaii, you think of the beach or you think of palm trees and relaxing by the ocean. But if you go on the top of this mountain, it can actually get really, really cold. So you see at the front of the, the telescope that's the closest to the camera, there's a little patch of white there, that's snow. There is snow during winter on the top of Mauna Kea. And often sometimes you even get snowstorms and ice storms. And then the telescopes are actually shut closed because they're frozen. So it's actually pretty interesting. Um, but you can go up there and you're high up in the sky where the air is thinner. So it's a lot crisper. You get nicer images of the, the sky, all the stars and the galaxies that you want to look at. And it's also far away from light pollution from all the cities. So you can see stuff a lot better there. 
So I have had the chance to go to those telescopes. The one at the front is called the Gemini telescope. Gemini is a zodiac sign. It means twins. And it's because it has a twin exactly like it in the southern hemisphere in Chile. And the one farther back that's all white is the Canada France Hawaii telescope. And so the one in the back is 3.5 meters, very large, and the one in the front is 8.2 meters, so even larger. These are really huge telescopes that have big, big mirrors. A telescope that I use a lot when I was doing my graduate work, so that's when I was doing my master's degree and my PhD at Queen's University uh, a few years ago, now quite a few years ago actually, um, I went to a telescope in New Mexico and uh, I used it a lot it was called the Apache Point Observatory. And this was another telescope right next to it called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and uh, t telescope. And this telescope is really unique because it doesn't take specific instructions from astronomers. It just takes pictures of the entire sky every single night as much as it can and puts all that data online so that anyone can look at the sky. So often telescopes are owned by universities or by countries. And so if you want to use it as an astronomer, you have to be associated to that university or that country but sometimes you're not. And unfortunately, that means that you don't get good telescope time. But some telescopes take pictures of the sky and put all of that on the internet for anyone to use. And these telescopes allows everyone to do astronomy. So even if you are you know, in a country that doesn't necessarily have a lot of money to put into astronomy, you can do astronomy. Even you guys could go online right now to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey website and look at that data and do astronomy yourself, even though you're not affiliated to university. So if you have free time tonight, make sure to go on the website and then do your own science there. So the telescopes that I've shown you now have been on the earth, on the ground, and those are really useful and it's a lot cheaper to make those and you can keep building them and keep putting new instruments on them. But sometimes you have to go to space to do astronomy because we live on the earth and there's an atmosphere around us and that atmosphere protects us from certain kinds of light that are bad for us like ultraviolet light is an example the really really harmful rays that sun um, emits that can harm us some of the light goes through the atmosphere which is why you have to put sunscreen on to protect yourself but the atmosphere around us the air around us protects us from a lot of that and that's good for us to live, but astronomy likes to study that kind of light too. And so we need to go to space to study those kinds of lights. So X-rays, gamma rays, um, ultraviolet, and some infrared. Infrared is like the light that humans and animals glow in. And so if you've seen science fiction movies and people are wearing night vision goggles, that's what you see. You see infrared. It's heat that's glowing off of people. And so here you have two space telescopes, one that is already up in the sky and it has been for almost 30 years now. It's called the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you've ever seen a really, really gorgeous image of a nebula or a galaxy, there's a good chance it was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble has been up for a long time, but it is starting to get pretty old. And the technology that we sent up a long time ago for that telescope is getting pretty old too and surpassed by all the new technology that we are building here. So we want to replace it by something called the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be three times bigger. And a difference between the two is also the type of light that it's going to study. So the Hubble Space Telescope studies what we call visible light. Visible light is what you can see with your eyes basically all around you. It's the colors of the rainbow. But the James Webb Space Telescope is going to study infrared light, which I mentioned. It's like the heat that's coming off your body. But there are things in space that are very, very bright in the infrared. And one of those things are exoplanets. So here at the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, that's what we specialize in, exoplanets. And it's not a coincidence that the principal investigator or the lead scientist that works on the James Webb Space Telescope in Canada is also the director of the Institute for Research on Exoplanets. So we're a big team here at the University of Montreal, but also other universities and institutes in Quebec. We're over 45 people now, graduate students all the way to professors who want to find exoplanets, and I'll explain what those are, but also alien life. And when I mean alien life, I don't necessarily mean little green men that are sending us radio signals, although there are some astronomers that do that, like at the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI, and they use these big radio dishes to try to listen to see if there's like alien TV shows that we can capture. 
but we are instead looking for more like microbes or bacterial life. And I'll explain how we do that with the James Space Telescope. So what's an exoplanet? So we have to start with the word planet here. And you all know that we have planets inside our own solar system. So our solar system has eight planets. When I was your age, we counted nine planets because we counted Pluto as a planet. But as we started exploring the solar system more and more, we discovered lots of different objects that looked a lot like Pluto. They had about the same size and were in the same spot in the solar system. And if we counted Pluto as a planet, we would have to count all of those things as planets too. So instead we made this new category called dwarf planets and we put Pluto in there with all its brothers and sisters who looked like it a lot. And now we count eight planets. Mercury all the way to Neptune, which is the farthest planet. And of course we are on earth. So those are the planets in our solar system and they orbit around a star, which we call our sun. But there are lots of other stars in our night sky. And for a long time, for many, many hundreds of years now, philosophers and scientists and astronomers have looked up at the night sky and at stars and have wondered, we have planets around our star. What if there were planets around those stars as well? So that's what an exoplanet is. Exo is, is a word for outside. It means outside of our solar system. And it's just a planet that is outside our solar system orbiting a star other than our sun. And exoplanets is like a brand new kind of science that we're, we're studying now. It's re relatively new in terms of astronomy. Astronomy is the oldest science. We've been doing it for, for thousands of years. Basically, all you need to do astronomy is your eyes. And even now, we can do astronomy using other things in our eyes. We can even listen to what's going on in space. So we've been doing astronomy for a long time, but exoplanets are very, very hard to study because they're very small compared to the star that they're orbiting and they're very far away. So the first exoplanet ever detected called 51 Pegasi B was actually detected in 1995. So you weren't born in 1995, but I was born in 1995. I'm actually older than the field of exoplanets. That's how young exoplanets are. And this was a really, really interesting discovery because when we discovered it, we could figure out how big this planet was around the star and how close it was to its star. And it was almost the size of Jupiter, so very, very big, but very close to its star. So if you look at the picture here, you can see the distance from the sun to Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars inside of our solar system. And below it, you can see how close this exoplanet, 51 Pegasi b, is to its star. It's like it's got its face stuck up right on the star. It's really, really close. And because of that, we created a type of a category of exoplanet called a hot Jupiter. So they're big like Jupiter, really big and puffy and a gas giant, but they're really, really up close to their star. So they're really, really hot. And the closer a planet is to its star, the faster it goes around it. So Mercury in our solar system is a planet that goes the fastest around the sun. Neptune goes the slowest. So this star, the, this planet, 51 Pegasi b, is so close to its star that it takes only four days to go around the sun. That means that one year on that planet is four days. On the Earth, it's one year, it's 365 days. So it is super, super close. So that was the first one we ever detected. But now, since then, we have discovered over 4,000 exoplanets. So these are all pictures because it's very hard to take a picture uh, of an exoplanet. These are drawings. They were, we have a lot of cool information on like what the color is of these exoplanets, if they might have rings or not, their size, what they're made of. But because we can't take a direct picture of them for the most part, we have to hire artists to make a drawing of them. But there are lots and lots of variety in these different types of planets that we've discovered. And what we want to do with the James Webb Space Telescope is study them even more and potentially find alien life on them. So the James Webb Space Telescope is an international mission and it is led by NASA. Everyone knows NASA. It, they are also the ones who uh, headed the Hubble Space Telescope. But what's really special about the James Webb Space Telescope is that Canada is a part of the mission. We weren't part of the Hubble Space Mission. But the Canadian Space Agency is giving an important component to the James Webb Space Telescope. It has four instruments on it that allows us to study the universe. And one of the instruments is Canadian. And what it really wants to do is to study those exoplanets that I talked about. 
There's also an extra component, an extra part on this telescope called the fine guidance sensor. And that's sort of like a stabilizer that makes sure that all of the pictures taken with the cameras on James Webb are super, super clear. So basically, Canada is helping all of the other instruments take nice images. We are a very important part of this mission. And another partner is also Europe, the European Space Agency. So the Webb Space Telescope is very different from Hubble because it's actually going to be a lot farther away from the Earth. So Hubble, I mentioned, we launched up 30 years ago almost, but when it was actually launched up, there was some problems with its mirrors. When it started taking pictures of the universe, the, pic the pictures were a little bit blurry. It's sort of like it needed glasses, but luckily we only sent up the Hubble Space Telescope 600 kilometers above the atmosphere. That's about 400 miles. So it's not very, very far. And we could actually send astronauts up there so that they could fix the, the telescope and put glasses on it. And they did that a few years after it was launched. And everything has been really, really great since then. But because the Webb Space Telescope is looking in the infrared and the Earth is actually very, very bright in the infrared light, we needed to send it much farther away. So it's going to be, instead of 600 kilometers away, 1.5 million kilometers away, super far away. And so far away, in fact, that we can't fix it if something goes wrong, which is why we are taking a very, very long and careful time to make sure everything works really, really well on the telescope. We have it go through a bunch of different tests on the Earth. So for example, one of the things we have to make sure works well on the James Webb Space Telescope is that it can survive the environment, the really, really violent environment of a rocket launch. So it's going to be launched up into space and it's actually going to be folded up like origami inside the rocket because it's so big. And when it launches up, it's going to be like shook up a lot. Oh, it's going to be vibrated like this. And if it vibrates and then breaks apart, that's bad news. We don't want to just send up a bunch of uh, little pieces that are broken apart. So we have to build these giant labs here on Earth where we shake the telescope to make sure that it can withstand the force of a rocket launch. But all those tests are going really, really well now, and we are set to launch it in 2021. So I mentioned Canada is a very important part of the mission, and the director of the institute where I work is also the lead scientist for this instrument. So this is the Canadian instrument. The instrument that works on exoplanets is called NEARIS, or Near Infrared Imager Slitless Spectrograph. It basically means that it takes pictures, but it also studies the light coming from the universe that is called a spectrum. So when you take the light all around you coming from the sun, you can make it pass through a prism and you break up the light into all the colors of the rainbow and it allows you to really study that light. So inside that instrument, it has a little camera so you can take pictures, but it also has like a prism that breaks up the light from the universe so you can study that light. And on top, you have the guiding camera that I mentioned that allows you to take really, really nice pictures with all the instruments. And about the size of that, it's about the size of a washing machine, the two pieces together. And it's attached at the back of the mirror with the other three instruments. On top of studying exoplanets, our instrument and the other instruments on web are going to be studying galaxies, which is something else that I study, all the way back to the very first galaxies ever created after the Big Bang. So the universe is really big and really old. It's about 14 billion years old. So a lot older than you and even a lot older than me. And about five, two, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, we started seeing the very first stars and the very first galaxies ever created. But because those are so, so far away, we haven't had a telescope big enough and precise enough to study those first galaxies. But James Webb is going to be able to do that, which allows us to see how galaxies were different at the very start of the universe versus how they look like now. So that allows scientists like me to study galaxies and how they've evolved over 14 billion years. So the entire history of the universe. So as you can see, the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna be like super revolutionary for all of astronomy, not only exoplanets, but also galaxies and everything in between. We're gonna study stuff in the solar system. We're gonna study black holes. We're gonna study stars. So it's super exciting. And my job is going to be to help the scientists communicate all of their exciting results 
to the public and make sure that all of Canada and all of my colleagues in the US with NASA are along for the ride and you're all uh, up to date with what's going on with James Webb. So that's it for James Webb. And now I am open to answering whatever questions you might have on the universe. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much for that. Emily. That was amazing. Um, I want to note too, we've got a couple of classes watching on YouTube as well. So if you guys want to type in your questions, Ms. Lee's class, Ms. Holloway's class, please do and I'll pass them on. But yeah, let's dive in. Uh, we also had our seventh class join us in the middle of your presentation, which is fantastic. So everybody's here. Let's start actually with Ms. Crouch's class. So Smithville, Missouri, if you guys have a question, you want to come on up and kick us off, go for it. Let's see if we've got your audio. Sorry, who did you ask? Ah, uh, yeah, you guys, Miss Crow just last. Oh, well, that's not us. Nope. <laughs> how many galaxies are there? How many galaxies are there? How many galaxies? So that is something that hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope will help us answer because there's a limit as to how far we've been able to study galaxies up until now. But our estimate, we think, our guess, our best guess is about one trillion galaxies in the visible universe. So one trillion is one with lots and lots of zeros. So it's bigger than a billion, it's bigger than a million. One trillion galaxies. Like a hard to fathom number. It's one of yeah. those, like, yes. Uh, awesome, all right, I'm Ms. Robinson's class. If you guys wanna come up, go for it. Um, I was just wondering if you have any advice for any aspiring astrophysicists or people <laughs> aspiring to go into your field of work. Awesome. Definitely. Um, is this for you? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, so definitely try to take as much science and math as you can going into high school. Um, and uh, so a lot of schools, are you, are you one of the Canadian classes or are you the US class, Canadian, Canadian. class? Yeah. So in university, um, there are very few astronomy departments, but you need to go to do at least a physics degree to become an astronomer. And I mean, astronomy is just studying the physics of what's going on in space. So physics degree is really great. Um, and basically what you learn in class from high school all, all the way to university is super helpful because it builds a really strong foundation but I found that a lot of what you do in everyday research is not something that you can learn in class. So this is going to be in a little while for you, but if it ends up being something that interests you, I encourage people to try to do research projects as early as possible. And universities more and more are trying to incorporate uh, high school students and undergraduate students in university in their research. So depending on, on where you are, you can try to figure out if there are any research opportunities at the universities around you. So it could be like a summer project or it can be something for uh, like a few hours a week for an entire semester kind of thing. The research component is really different from what you do in class and there's no substitute for that. And my last piece of advice would be try to learn how, how to do programming as early as possible because so much of astronomy involves computer coding now. Uh, it's really fun because you get to sometimes go to telescopes and take data, but after you have all that data, what you have to do with it is write tons and tons of computer code to analyze the data and try to get the science out of it. So computer coding is completely essential for doing astronomy now. Yeah. Awesome. What a great thorough answer. Uh, all right. And I'll pass along some resources too, because I know you guys are near Toronto and there's some really fantastic resources and places that are right near there. So I'll, I'll share that when we're done. Um, all right, Miss Winning's class, if you guys have one, come on up. Galaxies get bigger over time? Do galaxies get bigger over time? That is a great question. And they do get bigger over time typically, but that's not only, that's not because they're just like getting bigger and bigger on their own. It's because usually galaxies are in groups, they don't live alone in the universe and they interact with the other galaxies around them and they tend to merge together. So galaxies, I have a picture here that I can show you right here. So here you have two galaxies and they were two spiral galaxies initially. So a spiral galaxy is sort of like what we live in, in the Milky Way. And they got closer and closer together until they started colliding. So this collision takes 
a lot of time. So it's not like a video where if you put a telescope up there, you would see the collision happening in real time. It can take hundreds of millions of years for a collision to happen. But at the end of this collision, the two galaxies will have merged together and build one larger galaxy. And you often have a really big galaxy that emerges from these groups and it starts eating all the little guys. And in our own um, local group, where we have about 50 or 60 galaxies, the Milky Way, which is where we live, and Andromeda, which is our sister, are the two big bullies in, in, the, in the group, basically. They're like eating all of the galaxies around them. So they're getting bigger and bigger, but it's not just because they're getting bigger magically, it's because they're eating all of their little sisters around them. Very cool. All right, um, we're gonna go to Mr. Mill's class with the student is waiting so patiently and you guys are so keen. So yeah, come on up guys, go for it. Yeah. Oh, where did they go? Yeah, Mr. Oh, you guys muted yourselves again. Let me. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, you're good. Perfect. Go for it. <laughs> we did a debate in our class, and do you think Pluto should be reconsidered as a planet? Oh, <laughs> loaded question. Um, so I personally think no. Um, because if we were to include Pluto, we would have to include a bunch of other planets that are very similar to Pluto. So right now, the International Astronomical Union, they're the sort of the, the organization of astronomers that choose the names or the terminology that we use for different types of objects in space. And right now, what we call a dwarf planet like Pluto, we have five that are considered in there. But as we are getting better and better instruments, we think we would potentially be able to find thousands of objects that are similar to that. And I personally don't wanna to have to learn a thousand new planet names. That would be really hard, especially for someone who doesn't work only on solar system objects. Um, but I think just because a, an object is a dwarf planet doesn't mean that it's not super, super interesting to study. And so we didn't know a whole lot about Pluto for a long time just because it's so far away and we never really had a probe pass by it up until a few years ago. So NASA sent a probe called the New Horizons probe that looked at all the planets that are at the outside of the solar system and it passed really close by to Pluto. And that was the first time we got a really good shot of Pluto. And we saw like a little heart shape on it and everything. And we, we realized that Pluto was super interesting. It's an icy world and it has an atmosphere on it. Um, and it has like these mountains and like this really, really interesting terrain, like mountains and plateaus and everything. And we wouldn't have known that if it weren't for New Horizons. So just because it's not a, pl a planet doesn't mean that it's not super interesting. But because humans tend to want to make categories for things, it makes sense for Pluto and all of its similar objects to be in its own separate category. Upsetting, but true. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to take a couple questions from YouTube really quick. So Miss Lee's class, uh, which is grade six, is in Ottawa, Ontario. They wanted to ask, Adelia wanted to ask, what is the, are there any concerns about the carbon footprint created by creating James Webb? Is there something, you know, noted, noteworthy about the carbon footprint created when you're making something that big? That's interesting. Um, and as with any kind of science and, and technology, there is some amount of carbon footprint associated with it. Um, when I think about the way that it's been built, it's a really big object. And because it requires very specialized labs to do different tests, we've had to sort of like bus it around the US a bunch to go from lab to lab so it can pick up its different parts and go through different tests. Um, and then afterwards, when we're going to send it to its launch pad, which is in South America, we're gonna have to put it on a boat. So a boat is better than a plane already there, um, but afterwards we're gonna put it in a rocket. So a rocket is gonna make a lot of pollution. But that being said, if you put that amount of pollution compared to the amount of pollution related to like all the different things inside of what's going on on the earth, it's very, very, very small. And in fact, a lot of things associated with space astronomy can help us better understand climate change. So it's a small price that you have to pay, but you can actually learn a little bit more about what's going on in the Earth's atmosphere. And you can make comparisons with what's going on on different planets that have things similar to climate change or the greenhouse effect. 
So we've been able to learn a lot about our own climate change by looking at what's going on on Venus, which has an atmosphere 90 times thicker than the Earth. It has a really, really intense greenhouse effect. So because James Webb will, be, be, will allow us to study other planets and other exoplanets, we'll still be able to actually learn more about our own planet. But astronomers are actually very, very conscious of their own carbon footprint. And we are aware that uh, we tend to do a lot of public outreach compared to other types of scientists. And our type of science is less controversial than some other types of science like climate change. So there's lots of different groups of astronomers who get together and try to figure out how they can use their influence for the greater good and try to encourage people to be more eco-conscious. Outstanding, what a thoughtful answer. All right, um, another question from YouTube. So Ms. Holloway's group, so they are grade sevens and they are the Climact Detectives. That is their fun name that they ha I had to share because they put it on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to know, it's a two part question. How long will the James Webb Space Telescope be in space and what connection does it have to origami? Origami, yes. So I mentioned that um, the James Webb Space Telescope is so big that it's going to have to be folded up in order to fit inside the rocket that it's going to launch in. So I'm going to try to talk while I am bringing up stuff on my screen. So I'm going to do some multitasking. But um, it is on a really, really big rocket. And even though it's on a huge rocket, it's still the rocket is not big enough for it to fit inside. So we have to fold it up. And the way that we fold it up, we made the mirror such that it can fit inside by folding down two of its panels there. So you can see here that we have to fold up the whole thing. And there's also a big sun shield that like is folded up in two directions. So we have to be really clever in building something so big that can still be launched into space. And it's going to go and deploy out in space in a very, very nerve wracking sequence. It's gonna take 14 days for it to deploy. So it's very, very scary. And uh, we'll all be looking uh, very attentively to make sure that everything goes well. Once it goes in space, 1.5 million kilometers away, it's going to start its mission, which is going to last between five and 11 years. And unfortunately, uh, it can't last longer than that because it is going to be in a, in a what we call a quasi-stable orbit. So that means that it is almost stable, but not quite stable. It requires a little bit of fuel to stay in its spot where we need it to be in order to point it in the right direction so we can take good pictures. But because it is, we're, we're sending it out into space, it only has a certain amount of fuel to stay in that spot. And at some point it's gonna run out of fuel, unfortunately. And so the maximum lifetime of that mission is 11 years. At that point, we won't be able to control where it's pointing anymore. It could still try to take pictures, but it's going to be sort of like swinging around wildly. And it's going to slowly start drifting farther and farther away from the sun. So the real answer is it's going to be in space forever until it crashes into something else or we decide to pick it up. But it's going to only be usable in space for up to 11 years. Okay, very cool. Uh, all right, let's go back to our live classes. So Miss Jacob's group, if you guys want to come up, go for it. Can I <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Carla. So um, is there any meaning behind the James Webb telescope being pink and yellow? Pink, pink and yellow. Uh, oh, pink, okay, okay, I see. All right. Yeah, that's a little bit of a misleading picture there. <laughs> and I realized. So let me find a better picture to show the real colors of it. No pressure. Okay, so here you can't see the sun shield, but the sun shield is actually silver. And, and the yellow is because it's actually coated in gold. So that's a really good question for the mirror. So you can't see it for the Hubble Space Telescope, but the mirror inside of it is silver because it's coated in aluminum. And the reason is because aluminum is the most reflective material you can use for the, the visible part of light, which is what it studies. But for infrared light, gold is the best material you can use. So we've coated the mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope with a fine layer of gold. And it's not just to make it fancy, it's to make it work better for infrared light. So that's why it's gold there. And then the sun shield, which looked pink in the image that I showed you here, but it actually, that's just sort of like a reflection in the animation that, that you see. It's actually a silver color. 
and it's made of a material sort of like mylar and it is a very very reflective material and the reason why it's there it's to protect the telescope from the sun so it's always going to be oriented or, or placed such that the mirror is facing away from the sun and there's the sun shield that's protecting it from the sun and that's because in the infrared light, we want to make sure that the telescope stays very, very cold. Otherwise, all of the instruments are going to be overheated and can't really look at the, take good pictures of the universe. So we have to keep that side of the, the telescope cold and protected with a sun shield. And it just so happens that that mylar that the sun shield is made of uh, is silver. So it's actually silver and gold. So even fancier than pink and gold. Very fitting for uh, Rudolph Red Nose Radio coming up soon on TV. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's go to Ms. Riva's class and come on up. Got, oh, let's, mic should be unmuted. Okay, so Ms. Riva's class, if not letting me demute oh, your mic. We're good. Oh, you're good, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. Okay, if, so. our, if our Earth keeps on getting warmer and we need to move to a new planet, what would that, what would that planet be and why would we move to that planet? <laughs> Oh boy. No pressure. <laughs> so that is that is a super interesting question. And often when people find out that we study exoplanets, they ask us, are you looking for a plan B? Is, is that why you're, you're studying exoplanets? And we want to make it super clear that we are not looking for a plan B. Um, all these planets are super interesting, but they are so far away that we do not have the technology to even think about getting there in any kind of reasonable time. So if we take even the fastest space probe that we've ever built, it's pretty new. It's called the Parker Solar Probe, and it's this space probe that goes towards the sun. It goes super fast. It goes like it goes like 200 kilometers per second, like so like incredibly fast. Even on that probe, which is not meant to carry humans around, it would take 7,000 years to get to the closest exoplanet. So we cannot get to these exoplanets and we cannot guarantee that when we get there, they would be livable for us. So we are very interested in finding an exoplanet that is sort of like the earth that is rocky and would have an atmosphere and maybe water and oxygen, but it's not to go there. It's to try to figure out how common a planet like the earth is and potentially figure out if life can exist somewhere else in the universe and also figure out how life started here on earth, because that's still a mystery. We don't know how life was created here. So if we can find other life forms elsewhere, we might be able to better understand ourselves. But the more we're looking into exoplanets, the more we realize it's actually very rare to find something that is exactly like the earth. So if anything, people studying exoplanets are even more aware of how important it is to take care of this planet because it is no easy feat to go somewhere else. Yeah, uh, you covered exoplanets brilliantly there. I just want to highlight in case the student was thinking about Mars as well, that are consistently when we have sessions with Mars researchers, it's fantastic. We should definitely go. It's exciting as a prospect, but no matter what, it will always be more unlivable than the Earth is. If the Earth is absolutely ravaged by climate change, it will still be way more of a paradise than any other planet or any other body we can go to. Um, but yeah, fantastic answer. All right. Let's wrap it up in our live classes with our, our first round of questions with Miss Lode's class. We're getting some great answers here. Uh, so yeah, now your mic wasn't working earlier, Miss Lode. Let's see if it is now. And if it's not, you can type in a question and I'll pass it along. Fingers crossed. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. No, so your mic's still not working. So play with it and then press the chat bar on the bottom of your screen, little chat bar, oval three dots, type in some questions and I'll pass them on in a minute. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna go back, we'll do another round. So we'll start in this Crouch's class. If you guys wanna come up for a second question, go for it. We got about 12 minutes left or so guys. We'll try and get through these and see if we can get everyone in one more time. Do you think that there is alien life? If so, <laughs> what kind? Yes. <laughs> yes. So that is another question that I get a lot when people find out we study exoplanets is, do I believe in aliens? And the answer is, I do believe in aliens, but again, not necessarily little green men or, you know, the aliens with the giant eyes that are coming to Earth. As far as we know, we don't have any proof that we've been visited by alien life before. But so I mentioned that there's one trillion galaxies. Uh, in the visible universe. So each galaxy has about 200 billion stars. And on average, each star has about one planet orbiting that star. 
So if you do 1 trillion times 200 billion, that's about the number of planets that you have in the known universe. To think that the earth is the only place where life was created seems like a big waste of space to me. And so statistically speaking, I think that there is life somewhere out there. It might not be as uh, complex as we are or as animals around us are. It could be just viruses or microbes or worse yet, it could be a form that we can't even imagine in our minds. So we are only uh, able to study life as we know it here on Earth, but there might be life as we don't know it out in the universe that could be staring straight at us right now and we can't even recognize it because it's so different from us. So it might be that life is super, super different from everything that we expect, but it doesn't mean that we would necessarily be able to communicate with it. And it could also be that life existed a long time ago and that life became extinct or we will become extinct before another kind of life would start. As I mentioned, the universe has been around for a long time and life forms often created and then go extinct in relatively short periods of time. So in order to try and communicate with these life forms, we would have to get our timing perfectly right too. So there's lots of different aspects that make it hard to communicate or detect life. But I just think statistically speaking, there's gotta be something else out there. I've always loved the analogy that like what we've explored so far with the other planets in our solar system outwards is if you went to the beach with a cup and dipped it in the water and you know had this cup of water and said, oh, there's no fish in the ocean uh, compared to all that's out there in the universe. And it's really, really fantastic. We love that question. Uh, all right, uh, Ms. Lois's class asked, what got you interested in studying space? So as I mentioned, I've always known that I wanted to be an astronomer or at least a scientist. Uh, both my parents are scientists, they're engineers, uh, my dad uh, tested and built materials and my mom actually builds airplanes. She still builds air airplanes now. And so I had a lot of signs around me. Oh, did I lose everyone? Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh I'm back. back. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> you were, I don't know what the kids got. I ended where your mom is still building airplanes. It's probably because they're secret airplanes. We couldn't tell the children. That's she, does, she does actually have some clearance where she's not allowed to talk about some of her work. So, so yeah, the government heard me and then like froze, froze my connection. Um, so I had a lot of science around me. And as I mentioned, I really like to, to study nature a lot. And um, one interesting thing that I liked a lot about astronomy is it's the only science that I could think of where the objects that I study are completely removed from me. So I'm not part of the experiment. So it feels like a very pure science. In almost all kinds of science, the scientist becomes a part of the experiment. So if you're in a lab, you are, you know, dealing with the chemicals. So, you know, part of you is potentially being like contaminating the experiment. If you're a zoologist or an ecologist, you go out in nature, you're affecting the environment that you're studying. Even in physics, there's like certain weird laws where once you observe an electron, you've like set its, its status, its position. So you've just affected the experiment. But the galaxies that I study don't care at all that I'm studying them. They don't know that I'm looking at them at all. So it's a very like pure science where I'm not affecting what I'm studying at all. And I really enjoy studying nature sort of like at its purest, most intense, majestic form. And so the universe and galaxies and, and exoplanets is like the most pure and majestic form of nature that I can think of. Very cool. Um, I have a quick question because I know we're not probably going to be able to get through as many questions as we'd like. Is there a place where students can look up and, and ask more questions to you personally or to, in, you know, the Institute of Exoplanets or to James Webb? Where can they do that? Yeah, so for um, our institute, you can reach us uh, on our website and it'll have all our social media on it at exoplanets.ca. You can contact me on my website at astropanda.space. And you have all my contact information there. So feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to answer whatever question you might have. Um, and uh, there we go, exactly, they're, they're right there. And um, for James Webb, uh, a really great site that has lots of lots of answers uh, is webtelescope.org. So that's run by uh, a bunch of my colleagues at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency also has a brand new James Webb Space Telescope 
uh, website that I helped build. So it's been online for about a month now, and it talks about all of the Canadian part of the, the mission. Excellent. So I will share, I, in fact, I already did share quite a few of those in an email that I sent ahead of the game. Uh, so you can check for those there and check for those in the chat bar too. Uh, quick question from a YouTube class, and then I'm going to try and take questions from some of our new classes that are joining us for the first time. So uh, Miss Lee's class wanted to ask, how long has the project been taking? So this is Jackie and Sasha uh, in her class. How long has James Webb been being built? So it's been a pretty long time, actually. Um, and that's not unusual. These missions take <coughs> many, many decades in order to, to build and finally launch up. Canada became involved in the project in about the year 2000 and when we became involved at that time I, I didn't personally become involved at that point but Canada it was set to launch in 2008 so as you can see it's still not launched there have been several delays some of it have been technical problems some of it have been um, just trying to get enough money and enough support for the telescope but it has been about 20 years since the mission really started being put together, but the idea of the James Webb Space Telescope was already being discussed while Hubble was at the very, very start of its mission. And that's what's very important about astronomy. You can't just like sort of send something up and then sort of sit down and look at each other and say, okay, now what, now what do we do? Like you have to think of these things 20, 30 years in advance. So now we're working on James Webb and it'll be launched soon, but we need to already be thinking about what comes after James Webb. And sort of that's what the, that's what astronomers, especially in Canada, that's the exercise we're doing now, trying to figure out what we're going to do after James Webb. Very cool. All right. Um, Ms. Jacobs class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Daniel. An asteroid might hit the James Webb telescope. What do you do to prevent that? Oh boy, you, 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 you cross all your fingers and your toes and, and you hope that that never happens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I mentioned before a quasi stable orbit. So now I'm going to get into like the real details with you guys. It's going to be pretty intense. So there are certain points around the sun and around the earth where the orbits are more stable. They're called Lagrange points. And if you go into physics later on, you will learn about them and they will give you a headache. They're pretty complicated to like to, to calculate. But some orbits, some Lagrange points are stable, which means that lots of stuff accumulates there. Like it's sort of like a, a little divot where like all the dirt in the universe like starts collecting there. And some points are like that. Lagrange points and all the asteroids sort of start collecting there and we didn't want that for James Webb because we didn't want it to get hit. So we put it on a quasi stable Lagrange point so that we wouldn't be in an area where a bunch of asteroids are accumulating there. So that means that there are fewer asteroids in that area but we also have the sun shield which can, which can be a little bit of a protection and in general people don't realize how empty space is. There are a good number of asteroids out there, but if you take all the asteroids in the asteroid belt together, you get about 20% of the amount of stuff that's in the moon, just the moon. And it's scattered over like a really huge area. So we took extra precautions to make sure we put James Webb in a place where there aren't a lot of asteroids. And there is a little bit of protection around James Webb. We would have to be super unlucky to be hit by an asteroid at this point. If it does, we just have to hope for the best and that what you gets in. hit is not a very critical system. But we took all our precautions before. And for the next telescope, we'll fit it with like super asteroid blasting lasers. <laughs> that, that's something we can pack in a little bit with the origami uh, trick we learned earlier. All right, uh, Miss Reva's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. And we're gonna wrap up with Miss Robinson's in a minute. Yes. He's saying, what is the Virgo cluster that you've been studying? The Virgo cluster, yes. All right. So I mentioned that um, galaxies tend to be in groups. They don't like being alone in the universe. There are some loners, but for the most part, they're not. They're not alone. And I study one group in particular called the Virgo cluster. So you have a picture here of the Virgo cluster. And it is one of the richest, most dense groups of galaxies that we know of. It has about 4,000 galaxies inside of it. So our local group, which is where the Milky Way and Andromeda are, I mentioned there's like 50 or 60 galaxies total. 
So this one has 4,000, a lot more galaxies. And what is really interesting about the Virgo cluster, this particular group of galaxies, is that they're very densely packed together. So they're interacting a lot more. And that allows scientists and astronomers like me to study how galaxies are changed by their interactions with their neighbors. So just like humans, galaxies are affected by what they're born with sort of like almost their genetics, but also their environment around them. And we want to figure out which part is, of their evolution is affected by their environment, like in the Virgo cluster, and which is affected by their genetics or what's inside of them. And the Virgo cluster really allows you to do that because there are so many galaxies packed in a tight, tight space like that. So it is my favorite spot in the universe. And uh, I have certain favorite galaxies in there too. And, and I'm really studying that because you get lots of lots of information in one small space. Very cool. All right. I know we could go all day and these are such fantastic questions. We're going to wrap up with one more one from Miss Robinson's class. Um, so if you guys want to end us off, come on up. Oh. Hey, yeah, you're good to go. Um, so say teleportation or light speed were possible, light speed travel were possible, what would the logical course of action for space exploration be? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> wow. Um, so I, I feel, I don't know if it's a logical course of action, but I feel like something that would inevitably happen is to try to identify interesting um, resources that we could try to find in the universe. So I, a, a lot of times when people talk about asteroids nowadays, they don't just talk about them scientifically. They almost talk about how good they are for resources. So asteroids can often have lots of interesting precious metals. Um, and so people look at an asteroid and try to figure out, okay, this asteroid is worth $24 trillion. So I feel like one thing that people would want to do is try to use things in our solar system or even beyond for, for resources. But I feel like maybe that would be trying to um, not fix the problems we have on Earth in terms of not using resources effectively, but sort of like just shifting the problem to further down the road. If we don't use our resources now properly, just because we are giving more resources doesn't mean that we'll use those properly. We'll just like, you know, start ruining those resources. So I feel like a lot of people are starting to think about how to commercialize space. And so if we were able to go into those regions, things would start going into that direction. But I hope that there would still be some interest in, in studying space scientifically and not only commercially. But that is the honest answer that I have for you. Very cool. Uh, Natalie, in our two sessions with you, you've probably got the hardest, most out of the blue questions we've ever had. So I appreciate all of the fantastic <laughs> answers. They're amazing. Great job, guys. Um, so yes, uh, we've already passed along a bunch of resources where you guys can learn more. So do check out the email about that. Natalie, that was fantastic. And as you know, what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Natalie for joining us today. Everyone is it's now so demuted. Go for it. <laughs> 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 awesome guys thank you so so much for joining us uh natalie that was amazing we look so forward to having you back again soon thanks for having me all right